Hi, everybody. Uh, this is the second episode of the Patreon podcast, uh, which I think I'm calling the Chaotic Stupid Podcast. And uh, this week, my guest will be programmer Ryan Juckett. Hi, Ryan. How's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. How are you doing? I am doing great. Can you uh, uh, give the the viewers a little taste of your resume? Like, what have you what have you done in the past, and what are you working sure. on? If you can say. So, I guess I, I started in the industry in 2004. I guess I graduated mm. from uh, DigiPen, which is sort of a game focused school, um, and then I went to NeverSoft, where I worked on like this old Western game called Gun. It's like a third person shooter. Oh yeah, Gun. I remember Gun. Yeah, and then um, I did I did like all the AI on well, not all the AI, but I worked on AI on that. Okay. Um, and then I worked on one of the Tony Hawk games, Project Eight, and then in the middle of Proving Ground, and when we were starting on Guitar Hero, mm -hmm. I left NeverSoft and went to Pandemic, and I worked on um, Saboteur for a bit, just a very small period, and I got. Then I got offered a spot to work at this place called uh, Offset Software. We were making this game called Project Offset. It was like this up-and-coming 3D, fancy, pretty RPG thing. Was that one of the Spielberg um, ones? That was not one of the Spielberg, one of the Spielberg ones. ones. This was okay. like an independent thing, and it was very like big in that, like, oh, my God, this could be so amazing because you know, everyone projects onto something, right? Not I, think I, been great. I think I remember hearing about it. Did it ever come out? It did not ever come okay. out. So, that's, um, so it's legend in that, in yes. that way. We ran out of money. They eventually got bought by Intel. Um, and the only thing that's ever come out on that engine is actually Firefall is semi-built on that engine. They licensed mm -hmm. it, but they've pretty much completely rewrote it before they shipped. That's um, the case case with engines, I've noticed, yeah. Yeah, they die away. <laughs> the uh, Yeah, so then I did independent for a while, uh, just doing some contract jobs. And then one of the places I contracted at was Bionic. Which is where we met. Yes, so that you you hopped on a little bit after I joined, because um, I helped them do the demo, like the big prototype. Oh man, I I remember. You know, I have that DVD. I should put some footage. Of I it. still have that too, and it doesn't work anymore. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, kind of bums me out. Was it a Wii disc or a DVD? I have the DVD, like the videos. Okay. Yeah, I found the, the DVD. Yeah. If mine works, I'll send you a copy. <laughs> the uh... yes, yes, we did that. We. We were both there until that studio fell apart, and then we went to, well, I went to the sister studio of High Impact, and then I was at High Impact for a good while, and now I am at Bungie. Bungie. Um, I've heard of them. They're a small studio, right? Small studio, yeah. and uh, I do, I'm the lead sandbox engineer, so nice. like all gameplay stuff, so player control type things. Um, so yeah, now I'm on Destiny. Um, so throughout that whole time, it's, I've sort of covered the gamut of all the parts so you can program in a game. Um, and then I've, I've usually had some bit of like design, bit of a like uh, tweak on it as far as like my interaction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's where I am now. And then I'm also making an indie game now because just having one job is not enough. Yeah. And uh, that I'm doing pretty much everything on. Um, and that's a studio called Hypersect that I founded. Okay. And uh, is that is that out? I remember you you said you got through Greenlight. Does that mean it's on Steam now, or that means I have the ability to port it to Steam? Oh, uh, okay. Because um, you know they have their whole platform for achievements and your and like you know their trading cards and all their stuff, right? right? Um, so basically, I can now start making it for Steam. So it's not out yet. Okay. Um, it is still in the convention stage of its life, running around. Getting the word out. How do you do that? How do you work uh, a real job and then also have time to, to, to dev a game and go to conventions? Yeah. So <laughs> that is a great question. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, I mean, you have to really like making games, yeah, right? Yeah, um, that's true. That's the that's the most important part. Because at that point, uh, you're having, you know, it's 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 kind of like a passion project. Right. right. It's like, this is really fun. I'm doing everything is coming from me, which is, you know, it's very different than working with a huge studio, right? It's very rare that any part of any game you work on at a studio just comes completely from one person. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a blast. And then the whole convention thing I'm figuring out now, I've shown it at two small things. The big ones are starting this weekend and next weekend with uh, Bitbash and then PAX, which is huge. Yes. Um, I've heard of PAX. 
but yeah, it's kind of like for those, I just take some vacation days. Okay. Um, and then for programming, it's just like nights, weekends, and you know, play testing with like friends, getting them over to play the game and stuff. That's cool that Bungie lets you do that. I and mean, most of the places I worked for said if I made anything in my spare time, they owned it. Yeah, so Bungie's good with that. There's, you know, like uh, Arena, that's really good with that. Fifth Cell. I've heard about that. Yeah. Um, Fifth Cell. Different. Yeah, different studios have different uh, policies, right? Uh, did you ever work with my, my, I have a friend who worked at Bungie. Your name was Annie Vandermeer Mitsoda. Did you ever work with her? Yes. Yeah. Not, we didn't know, like I know who she was, but. Okay. But you didn't necessarily do a lot together. Yeah. She's in the indie scene now too. Yes. She has a company with her husband, I think. Yes. Double Bear. I'll probably be interviewing her at some point, which will be fun. And I'll have to use the, uh, the profanity yeah. sensor a lot. <laughs> That's good. I like that you can keep linking your guests together. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. Everyone will yeah. think there's some sort of crazy conspiracy web going on. Yeah. And if, <laughs> if I'm lucky, I can get Reddit to do one of those crazy GIFs with like all the red lines and arrows yeah. pointing to each other. That'd be fantastic. So, uh, so you said you've had um, a bit of experience doing everything that a programmer can do. Is there anything in general that you can say programmers do? Anything in general I could say programmers do? I mean, they talk to the machine, right? They yeah. are the translator between the, you know, the spoken word and what people think um, into actually making that something a computer can understand. So, um, yeah, trying to make sure, I mean, nothing works unless you touch it, yeah? Yeah, like, I mean, you know, somebody has to instruct to the computer and say, like, okay, people know what they envision, right? But how does that actually work piece by piece and how do I tell this like deterministic box to simulate that right right um, I think yeah. I, if I had to like abstract it out and be you know very high level about it I think that's mm -hmm. kind of your job right just weaving dreams out of thin air yeah yeah sure. <laughs> that's that sounds like a good description I'll bet everyone wants to be a programmer now yes <laughs> uh so that's sort of in general in specific what would you say uh that you do so. Let, let's just take the the job you have now as the uh, lead sandbox programmer. What what sort of things do you do in that job? Um, it's a it's a range, right? Because there's a bit of uh, management there, and then there's a bit of uh, actual engineering, right? So right. when you're doing the engineering side, it is so you know maybe you're working on a feature, maybe you're fixing a bug, maybe you are making workflows easier for people so that they mm -hmm. can produce stuff faster. Um, and all of those are a little different, right? Where right, right. if you're working on a feature, it's more collaborate with people, get everyone on the same page, and then iterate and tweak and expose parameters for someone to use, or mm -hmm. you know, adjust how different you know systems interact together. Um, a lot of it these days, I think, in the industry, because it's, well, at least in the AAA industry, right, is right, right, making it so. Making it so you can produce stuff faster is a huge part of like how you view engineering, right? Like how whether it's like right. produce more content quickly or just iterate quicker because people need to do more, right? Yeah, I mean when you when you consider how much money a, a studio burns every single hour that it's open, it makes a lot of sense that it you know, you would need people to make that go smoother, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah and like when we were working at Bionic, it was a bit smaller and we could get away a bit more with like, you know, arcane little, oh, you edit this text file here and it'll be fine, right? Uh, because <laughs> we're yeah. sitting right next to each other and it's like, you know, yell over the, the wall and say, what am I doing? Or, you know, um, and I think it's interesting because that makes you very malleable, right? And you don't have to make anything as robust because it's kind of mm -hmm. like, it can have some rough edges and it's not really going to be the end of the world. And right. that means you can sort of, that is a way you can start moving faster in that scenario where you're working with like 20, 30 people. And, uh, uh, you know, like I remember when we were doing that, I mean, if I, if I raised my voice slightly above talking, you could hear me. Oh yeah. So it was, it was very, we were all very close together. So yeah, it, it, uh, and we, we had, uh, such crazy deadlines that I don't know if we could have done anything without that sort of, uh, quicker implementation. Yeah. It's interesting. Like you look at, you know, the, the games we made there and at High Impact weren't like uh, these, you know, things that are going to go down in like gaming history. Right. <laughs> right but, yeah. And sometimes you look at a studio and like there's studios that a lot of them have sort of gone away now, but where it's like, oh, 
that studio whatever like they don't make great things and sometimes people associate that with like oh there must not be talented people there which is not really true because it's usually yeah if they're making things at all you know, it's usually there's usually a bigger swing of talent, but right, yeah, there's yeah. often some serious talent there just to like be able to get a thing out the door at the like crazy deadlines and low budgets they have, and you can actually find some like really strong people at those studios. That's the experience I've had too. I mean, when I was like maybe the first two or three years of my career, I worried a lot about uh, what the games were that people had worked on, and then after that, it was just a matter of talking to people and see if they sort of knew what they were doing. Yeah, because uh, that you can have a conversation with another industry vet and kind of gauge, like uh, my my friend Derek used to say, you can tell when someone gets it, and he always pronounced "gets it" that way, gets it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because there's there's a very particular set of things that you're looking for that nobody seems to know how to say. Yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, but I know what you mean. Yeah, at at every studio there are those people who get it if they're producing anything at all because it's. I mean, just the fact that games get made every year is a miracle. Yes. Um, so uh, as a programmer, uh, do you, in, in the sort of programming you do, and I already know the answer to this, but I'm just going to ask it this way anyway. Uh, do you interact with designers? Yes, all the time. Let's say in specific for, for the sandbox stuff, what kind of interactions do you have with what kind of designers? Uh, yeah, I mean, on the... The sandbox team itself. Um, there's mm -hmm. people making weapons, people making abilities, people making vehicles, um, and that's the focus of the designers I interact with at Bungie. Um, you know, where it's we want some new behavior on some gun or some little feature or some very subtle, you know, adjustment to how feedback to the player works. Um, mm -hmm. And it's going back and forth and saying like, oh, well, what if we, you know, like. I know we could do these types of things easy. You might not have thought of this because you don't know how the underlying systems work. And then, right, right, yeah, yeah. Or stuff like that. Um, you know, or when it was uh, back at like Bionic, it would be like, you know, we want this boss to do these things. Like, what, <laughs> what is feasible? Like, bash a helicopter into pieces and stuff, yeah. Yeah, and like, what it's <laughs> like, what things that are both like enticing from the design standpoint and like you get the most bang for buck out of it is kind of what you're looking for, yeah. right? Like here's things we can do. And it might be like you can do something complicated that one person didn't think they should even be able to yeah, ask for. Yeah. And that's uh, that's usually where collaboration pays off the most. Um, yeah, and I've been fortunate, like all the positions I've had from, from back at like working at Neversoft and all the way up, I have, uh, you know, being an engineer, you go in and you need to sort of build up that design trust. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But it is, it is always happened for me where I have ended up usually with a decent, not that I'm in there like just designing levels right. or something like that, but I have a decent amount of like uh, design responsibility and just like control of just like, all right, figure this part out, like kind of do a little bit how you want. And then I'll expect, you know, I trust you to come back to me with something that I can then play with. And it's not um, like a one way relationship right. yeah, type yeah. deal. I mean, that's, that's how I remember it working at Bionic. Uh, I could, I could have a feature that wouldn't necessarily be all the way fleshed out, but we'd know that if, if you took it on, that you would have enough design sense to, you know, sort of sand out some of those areas or at least know where the areas were rough. You know, uh, some people you have to sort of sit with them for that. So it's really rare and awesome when you can find a programmer who has that sort of sense. Yeah. And, and like, that's the you know, type of stuff that like, like Bungie with our, the, the gameplay engineering team mm -hmm. that you really look for when you're hiring someone, right? right. Is that they can do that. Um, and then when I'm working on my own project, it's great because I just talk to myself. And just, <laughs> you know, like whatever, I sort of have both minds at that point, which is interesting where I can... Sometimes it's almost... You could argue it's limiting in some ways because you know what's going to be hard from an engineering standpoint, so you might not ask for the hard thing. I um, know what you mean. I do that too, yeah. And, and like sometimes having that uh, freedom of like, I'm not really concerned about what it's going to take to do it. I just want to see it as a reality is uh, mm -hmm. that opens up a certain set of doors um, creatively. And then also understanding what's there and how to exploit it from the other side also opens up stuff. So, it, you know, it's a give and take. Um, um, so the way I remember this is so at Insomniac, uh, we used to use Maya as a gameplay placement tool 
and then eventually we switched it over to a custom tool because we wanted to have features that uh, Maya couldn't support. And one of those features was live updating. You know, so if if I move a crate on my computer in Maya, I can see it moving up in the game that's running live on the the TV next to me. Sure. And so I, I remember uh, we we came in and none of us wanted to ask for live updating because we were using Maya at Bionic for for gameplay placement, and we just thought, oh, it's impossible. And then one night you came over to my desk and you sort of noticed that it, I was doing something and it was taking a long time, and you're like, you know, it would be it'd be much easier if you could live update that, huh? And I said, oh yeah, that, that would be great. And then you, you, you stayed late that night and the next day we had live updating. Yeah. I mean, I remember it was like a, I know it was over a weekend or something. Cause I think I stopped in on the weekend to do a bit of it. Um, Cause we also worked with the tools a bit there as engineers too. Right. Um, right. Yeah. You guys would spend a lot of time in Maya more so than some other places. Yeah. And both in like, cause we did a bit of our visual scripting in Maya almost through objects, right. They're linking them together um, and setting their variables and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But even just like, you know, we would have things where like, Oh, you would connect these two objects and draw a line between them. And this thing would send a message to the one it was linked to. Right. And we would, which is something like nowadays you would be doing in like blueprints and unreal or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, there's much more sophisticated methods these days. Sure, but it got the job done, and it, you know it had yeah. it had some benefits. But it's uh, but the other thing we did all the time there was camera editing, and mm. I did the oh man yeah, you know, and like I programmed the camera system for that, um, and I I think that's probably one of the strongest points in that game from like a if you were to look at camera it and tech. go like this is a thing that it it did uh, in, a, in a technically and I don't want to say it's like impressive because it's not like doing anything super fancy, but it's it's very competent. Yeah, um, I mean the I I used I used the tricks that we learned on that camera in tons of games that I worked on. Like that was super useful for me. Just it's not that there was anything really complicated. It's just that there were a bunch of really simple overlapping coolnesses about it. Yeah, and doing a camera that the player doesn't control that views two people running around is complex. Um, but and it requires a lot of tweaking, and I remember that being a big reason I wanted live update because mm -hmm. editing the cameras without it is like a nightmare um, because you're just like shifting them a little bit and then seeing how that reacts when it tries to frame multiple people on the screen. Um, and I remember that being a big deal for like my personal workflow for it, and definitely was a motivator. Um, yeah, I mean, and when we were setting up rails, uh, like literal lines that cameras had to follow and then other lines that they were looking at and stuff like that. Yeah, it was it's definitely necessary to be able to see that working live. You, the, the answer to this can be no if you don't have a story. But has there ever been a situation where uh, you were having trouble c communicating with a designer and then something either you did or the designer did helped a lot in terms of uh, uh, the communication? I think of a specific case that that really stands out where like I did not agree with a design mm -hmm. and you know I pushed back on it for a while before just doing it and afterwards it came out to be fantastic. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> and like like and that's and it's hard to 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 know when that's going to happen right like when to trust your instinct that like this is not going to be worth us doing right right and or like i and it's it's kind of like respect in the opposite direction where i was saying like as an engineer you have to build some design respect with the designer to get some of that control but also as an engineer when you are the one programming the thing the designer has to earn some design respect with you for you to like take the word right yeah um the uh, yeah, and like this case specifically, uh, this was on Project Offset, and um, the and like it's not it's not even like I didn't trust the design beforehand, like I loved him, but it was just like the they wanted to do a thing where you know you shoot um, a bow and arrow, and then if the other person blocks just at the right time, it'll deflect it back, right? Oh, okay. Um, and it was it's just like this thing where I was like, that is like. A, that would never work. Like, that's ridiculous <laughs> that you can just constantly deflect projectile arced arrows right back at the guy, right? It's just like this goofy thing, and the game was kind of serious feeling. Um, he was like, no, 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 they did it in, like, 
one of the Unreal tournament games or something that was mm-hmm. on one of the consoles. Um, it was great, and he brought that in. I was like, eh, I don't know. And like, he's so passionate about that. I was like, all right, well, let's let's do it. And it was so fun in multiplayer to have someone like to like time that deflect and have it go back at them. And it was like the thing is like when you as a, a like obviously doing that action as a player doesn't require as much skill as it would take in real life. Right. But it yeah. was a, it was a sufficient enough amount of skill separation from normal blocking that you sort of associated your ability to do it with like, no, I did have that skill and that empowerment really like capitalized on that of seeing it like so perfectly executed in game. Nice. And it really, it did not feel like I expected where it was going to be this like super cheesy like thing that like stuck out. It was, it it definitely felt like, no, I did that. And that's because I can do that. Um, And that worked out really well. And I think, like after that, I, I try to look out for those cases a lot more where it's like, what are the chances that the the designer I'm working with is just seeing something I'm not seeing, right? Right, right, yeah. Uh, it, is there anything that uh, a designer can do that, that sort of... Uh... Yeah, I mean, it, that's, like, that's interesting too, just from like a... Interviewing like designers is hard, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I think as far as a... I think it is probably the hardest to in my mind to make a accurate judgment of like this is uh i understand their skill level right um, especially on the creative front it's a bit easier on like the systems evaluation front where you can say like here is some framework and how would you take this like set of constraints you know whether it's like these buttons or whatever and make something that achieves this goal and then you can kind of evaluate the design that came out of mm-hmm. um, where it's like you can evaluate this like systems design but i think like to be to be a really good designer you also want a bit of that like creative passion on top of that right yeah you, you there's there's something yeah yeah it's like that just that that enthusiasm kind of right or just like the you want that energy um and that like willingness to think outside the box in some ways um yeah, and it's it's also like it's, it's interesting because like design is that one you know sometimes in the industry you say that thing where it's like well anybody could be a designer right not meaning like anyone could be a good one but it's much harder to like wall yourself off as a designer and say like obviously I know the what the final call is going to be personally yeah yeah right because you don't like unless you've got some crazy you know, resume behind you, which, you know, some designers do. Mm -hmm. Um, It's harder to just like point to like, well, no, like look at all, look at these paintings I made, these textures, or look at, you know, this, like this thing I architected as an engineer um, and really have someone understand like that gives you the, the merit to say like, this is what should be the, the end call. And I think that kind of blends into what makes it hard to evaluate. Yeah. um, Yeah. And and I've seen people that are much better at doing that than I, am even close to from like, like like look, like talking to someone and just understanding how well they will be right. Um, those are all people that do design for a living as their primary job. Um, yeah. So I might just be might just be me that's bad at it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I I wouldn't say that. Uh, there's a lot of good designers out there, and there's also a lot of not so good designers out there. Uh, just like I'd imagine, there's a lot of good programmers and not good programmers. It's a bell curve, I imagine. Yeah. Um, okay. So the, another question I had was, uh, so when when I talked with Tony about this, he he told me that the the disciplines of design and programming had different relationships at the different studios he worked at. Mm-hmm. Uh, in your experience at the places you've worked at, what kind of designer programmer relationships are there? Yeah, I mean, I think you there's also there's a lot of different types of designers too, right? Yeah, From like yeah. mm-hmm. uh, people that just work at very high level, like uh, sort of overall creative direction, down to people designing a level, down to people designing player uh systemic things that will take place across an entire game mm-hmm. to people designing you know single enemies right like and i think each of those positions has different degree of sort of what their day-to-day is right um right how, how much of their stuff is implementation versus uh yeah uh, 
And it's it's almost like two different. It's not like two different. I don't know. In some ways, you could almost take certain parts of level design and say like, Oh, that's a whole different discipline to a degree. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. It, it, everybody breaks it up a little differently for sure. Yeah. Like I was talking to, uh, someone who worked on like torchlight recently. Um, and and just about how, how they're the designers would, you know, assemble all the parts of a level, right. Right. And put them all together themselves. Like an artist might make the props, but the designer is actually piecing it all together, which I think is called kind of also, how a lot of like Skyrim works, all their dungeons. Um, the they did a big talk on that a while ago, which is really cool. You know, and then you have places where designers will like gray box something, and then someone comes in and like arts over it, right? Which right, is kind of yeah. what we did at Bionic a lot, right? Yeah, that was the Insomniac way early on too. Yeah, and it's almost like now that so much of level design is based on just from a tech standpoint, mashing. Like a sync, like a small set of objects together in different ways. Yeah, um, is how a lot of levels are built now. Um, you mean that, you mean like art objects, so like uh, yeah. corridors and doors and stuff like that. It's even smaller than that, right? Like where you'll have like here's a pillar and here's this top of the pillar and here's this other thing. And people will just like scale and rotate them and just sort of like kit bash a big thing together really fast. Right, right. Um, and it ends up in this kind of weird world where like a designer can kind of piece stuff together if they wanted to on their own or an artist could do like it's it's not like the artist is modeling the level like we used to do yeah, yeah. where it's just like model it like it's this big sculpture right right it's sort of like you're modeling these bits and then someone is sort of like slamming them all together and they're at a granularity where you kind of want an artist to do it sometimes but it doesn't have to be um so you see that sometimes where design leads like sort of folds into the art side a bit mm-hmm. um you see a lot of places where design will do all of the gameplay scripting for a game what's the what's the difference between the gameplay scripting uh that they would do there and what a programmer would do at the same place so if you had a place that was very script driven um the sort of programmer is going to be a doing anything that's probably very uh complicated architecturally complicated or uh, an underlying system that's sort of you're trying to like provide a set of hooks that a designer can plug into where like a designer might say hey you should walk this guy should walk to this mm-hmm. point and the, and he's not going to program the pathfinding right, right yeah where the engineer would probably do that part right mm-hmm. um once you're sort of it's almost like a, a you're trying to divide it on like a bit of a language barrier a bit barrier a bit where the designer's script is sort of talking at a high enough level where you, if you could read the code, or if you could like talk it out in words, someone would sort of understand. Like on the, it was just like a you know your average gamer. Like, yeah, it's a little more Englishy. Yeah, and if they're using visual scripting, then sometimes it's very intuitive. Yeah, and I think that's kind of like a common place the divide happens where once it starts mm-hmm. getting into algorithmic stuff or just weird perfy you know, performance sensitive things. Um, the engineers will be down there. Oh yeah, or anything that uh, when it does get implemented just brings the engine to a crawl. A programmer might go in and re-implement that in code. Yeah, yeah, that's that. I've seen that a lot too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from the from the program side, from the, from the engineering side, there's, I mean, there, there's a huge variety too. From like places where the engineer will cover that stuff where I was just saying like, Oh, a designer would be doing scripting, right? An engineer is actually mm-hmm. either doing the scripting themselves, um, which I did a lot of scripting at Neversoft in addition to the underlying code. Mm-hmm. Um, and designers would also script too, but it depended on what the specific case was because sometimes just being in the scripting language had benefits mm-hmm. into itself where it wasn't like, here's this crutched language that's made so designers can understand it. It was like, no, <laughs> it's like, here's this thing with a specific set of benefits to using it. Um, and then both designers and engineers would use it. Um, and engineers would also go down in the lower level code when that was necess- you know, a necessity or had some other advantage, right? Like speed. Right. Um, the, yeah, I think like I've in, I guess at Bionic, it was a lot like that, where the engineers would program a lot of the gameplay. Neversoft is probably the most like scripty place I've worked, um, where it had a lot of 
uh, designers doing script work, and it's usually for levels. Okay. Like scripting a level. Right. Um, right. Yeah, and then engineers go all the way down to just like you know, I program really low-level graphics routines or tools or there's a big gamut there, but that's always exists unless you're working at a studio that's utilizing someone else's tech, right? Right, yeah. Then you're bound by the techs uh, for your Yeah, and you have engineers that, like, their sole job is just to integrate someone else's technology into your own game, right? Right, like Bink or any of those middleware things. Yeah, or there's, like, Havoc or bink or just like yeah if you worked on unreal um which i've never actually done personally but i would guess most studios have like here's a dude and his job is if, if not multiple guys just like maintain unreal um, and, <laughs> yeah and they don't because yeah. it's, it's a very big thing and there's all these hooks and like there's going to be problems and you have to understand all the like the different parts um and that's uh you know a lot of places have people that just do like deal with the physics like like the layer that hooks the two systems together right yeah not the physics underlying like system that's a replacement for havoc but you no know, like i use havoc or i use physx or whatever uh -huh. and there's a bunch of code that just connects the bits right and and uh that's a that's a decent chunk of time um so there's engineers that have a lot of their time doing that which is probably something people don't think about much I remember hearing a story about how on um, the first Jack and Daxter game, there was a huge part of the uh, uh, engine that was written in Lisp. Oh, yeah. Uh, and only one programmer at Naughty Dog knew Lisp. Uh, and so on the second one, there was someone whose job it was to translate all the Lisp code. Yeah, sometimes it's just uh, nobody knows this language. We need someone to re redo it so other people can work on it. Sure. Uh, let's see. So the, the last question I wanted to ask, so anyone in the industry with any position, be you a producer, a programmer, a designer, uh, anything, there's a whole lot of what you do that is completely invisible to the player. It, it becomes very difficult to describe what you do to someone who doesn't make video games. And, uh, so what I, what I wanted to ask you is in, in your work, do you find that difficult? Yeah, or I mean, it's, it is never easy explaining <laughs> what uh what it means when you make a game and yeah some of that it, it might be easier nowadays but like a, a lot of it is people you know they look for like a reference point in uh, popular media right um mm -hmm. or a reference point in someone they know um who maybe does this and like sometimes you'll get a lot of times, or at least I have a lot in the past, where you say like I make games, and they're like, oh so yeah, I have a friend that like tests games for a living, uh, okay. um, because there's a lot more tests out there, and I think people are more likely to know someone in that department, right? That's true. That's true, especially um, in a city that has a lot of devs. Yeah, uh, and then like you'll also get like back when Grandma's Boy came out, they're like, oh, it's like <laughs> the, the grandma, and you're like, well, not really. It's not, it's not exactly how it works. Um, I want to say there's some stuff. I don't watch enough TV, but like uh, nowadays, where there's stuff with like people in it that make games as like a main character, um, and I don't know how well it's represented, but maybe it's gotten better. Um, but that's usually something people point to when they try to like understand it, and then when they get down to like, no, I program it, and it's like, well, what is that? It's hard to get someone to like honestly understand it without <laughs> if you want to like really sit them down and just like bore them and you're like you didn't want to ask this you've made a huge mistake um <laughs> so like if if we're talking about maybe if like your barber asks the question uh do, do you have a go-to that you use for for when it's like that well so when i'm in a case where i work on um like there's certain parts that are easier to communicate right like right if you worked on the rendering uh, I think people have an easier time understanding that because it's kind of, you know, like 3D in movies or whatever, right? Like I wrote the thing that... Right, everybody's seen one of those faked up renderers in a in a movie, right? Where it's got the little progress bar and all the things, yeah. Something. And like the when I'm doing gameplay, I can at least point to something semi-tangible that you can like reference, right? Like, uh, like on Destiny, I could be like, I programmed the Sparrow, or I programmed, you know, how the guns, like how you aim down sights and how all the guns shoot. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, 
like it's harder. There's like other things where like I might not point to immediately. Like I programmed uh, the damage system, which is like how guys die <laughs> like logically, right? Right. Um, yeah. It's really complicated, but it's not as easy to to target out. Where like you know, or like on spyborgs, it's like I programmed that boss, right? Right. Like his behavior. And it never soft. I did AI uh, primarily, so I could say like I programmed the brains of things, right? Which sounds a lot more mm-hmm. impressive than it is. Um, you're a you're a brain programmer. Yeah. The so you, you try to point at that, um, and then you know if someone asks like, well, what does it mean to program? It's just all like ones and zeros, or what everyone thinks. Like you're sitting there typing <laughs> ones and zeros. Do people actually think that? I think so. <laughs> it seems. I was I was just curious. I mean, I I. Uh, I, I didn't have long enough with computers to come up with that image before I started programming, so I'm not sure. Because that's all they hear, right? Like, oh, everything's ones and zeros, and then like you know, you'll see like the matrix or something, and everything's just like garbage scrolling by really fast, <laughs> right? And like, that's, yeah, that's the code. Yeah, and uh, that so they kind of imagine that you work in hex dumps sometimes. And, you know, yeah, sometimes that is sometimes that's what you do. Or it's like they think it's like HTML, right? They're oh, like, yeah. I program. I've done HTML. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. I know people who get really offended uh, when someone says that HTML is programming. Uh, I'm not one of them, and then, uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not offended by it, but it's like it's it's hard to, and it's also like programming is so varied, even within like the field of like professional programming, right? Like if you're working in like you know, assembly, and then you got someone else working in, I don't know, like PHP. Right. Um, or like JavaScript, right? Like a huge, JavaScript is like this huge thing that people need to know how to do. Yep. But it is like a whole different world than actually like working at the hardware level. Um, yeah, the setting and unsetting registers and stuff. Yeah, so it's like mm-hmm. even within uh, the engineering field, like saying I'm a programmer doesn't mean... It doesn't give a clear picture of what you really do. So uh, I, the, I guess the last thing would be, do you have any, any final words, anything you want to say about like uh, uh, when inverses would be available or anything like that? Inverses, which is uh, going to be your future favorite game to play. No doubt. Is, no doubt. Uh, it's at inversesgame.com. I have not announced a release date yet. Um, uh, the only platform that is announced is... It'll be on Steam because it's gone through mm-hmm. Greenlight. Um, there will be hopefully some console uh, releases for all my friendly console gamers. Um, and I am, yeah, working away at it. It'll be, you know, getting shown around the country until it comes out and uh, definitely follow. And Do you have a, a good elevator description of it? Yeah, it's... Uh, you, know, you want to have an elevator pitch for a game, right? Where someone's like, right. what is it? And you want to just say, like, boom. Right, right. Um, and just to explain something that fast, you need to have something you can relate to. Like, the more unique something gets, the harder it would be to elevator pitch it, right? Like, right, right. I was trying to think of, like, a, a, a game that would have come out recently that would have, like, a, a hard elevator pitch... I was going to say like Proteus maybe, or, you know, there's like, there's some weird experimental stuff out there. Um, and Inversus is, with come up with this pitch, and I'll, I will give you some sort of pitch in a second, but the, the interesting thing is it, half of it is very familiar, mm-hmm. but in a non-interesting manner. Okay. Where it is like, there's part of this game that's very reminiscent of, say like, you know, uh, combat on Atari, or it's just like, it's a game, there's things, and they're just like shooting bullets at each other, right? And it's mm-hmm. like, whatever. There's another part of the game that is very novel and hasn't been done anywhere, and it's the interaction of those two that makes it very special. Um, but describing a mechanic that is novel quickly is hard. Yeah. So one of my elevator pitches for Inverses would be, it is Othello with guns. Just sorry, real quick. You mean Othello the board game, right? The- yes, I do mean Othello the board game. Which is, so that's an interesting thing too, right? So when someone says Othello to me, I go board game. There's some people you say Othello to, and they go like, oh, Shakespeare. Yeah, whatever, right? yeah. Um, and or, or they know Othello as Reversi. Yes. <laughs> but then if you say Reversi, a lot of people go, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So then, then you go like, 
It's kind of like Go-ish. It's less like Go mechanically, but it looks kind of it's black and white. Um, <laughs> so, so like even that is a problem. It's okay. a nightmare. That makes sense. The, uh, but otherwise, I would say like it's so hard. It's like so it is a game where you've got two teams uh, or two sides. You have a black player and a white player. Okay. And you each can uh, only move on colors of black or white. And when you shoot. You're not shooting to hit the other player. You are shooting to change the tiles to your color. And in so, you're both closing the player in and opening the world up for yourself. So it's in this constant struggle back and forth. Oh. And once you block the player in and shoot them, then you've won. So you are trying to shoot them like in any other game. But in this case, there's a huge strategy element in spatial control. You're, you're, it's basically, you're trying to bring chess into checkers, right? So there's a bit of checkmating to it? Yes, and you know, you've got limited ammo, and that all plays into like, you know, making the right call of when to spend it, where to spend it, mm -hmm. and then capitalizing on it, right? So right. it's making the strategic move and then having the skill to actually execute it. Um, but yeah, that is in versus. So it's multiplayer? It is primarily, so the, the primary mode is 1v1 uh, versus mode. Mm -hmm. There is also a single player arcade mode um, where you could imagine taking that mechanic and throwing it into like Robotron or Geometry Wars, right? Oh, so it's on a Which, sphere or a circle or something like that? Is that what you mean? Well, uh, what I mean is there's guys spawning in, you're playing for high score. Oh, but, I got it. I got it. Okay. But all those guys are on the opposite, you know, they're on the black tiles, you're on the white tiles, and it really changes up the dynamic of what it feels like to play those games, because the board is always shifting around you based on what you've been doing, right? Yeah, that sounds cool. Like, where you can get to is very dependent. And that was a huge deal with, like, the design of the game, is, like, I wanted, I wanted this, like, chaos theory type thing where it's, you know, every little piece you do is going to have a long-lasting effect. Right. Even if it's not, like... Oh, I remember that's because of whatever. It's just like the game evolves differently every time, but deterministically. It's not like random. Right. Sort of like um, how there's a ton of different possibilities when you start playing a chess game, but it's not deterministic. Right, right. Yeah. One more time, where are people going to be able to see this in the near future? So if you go to inversusgame.com, you can follow Facebook, Twitter, mailing list, um, dev blog, all that stuff that you'd expect. And it has got a Steam Greenlight page where it has passed on Greenlight. You can follow on there. Um, and then there will be future announcements of more platforms that it's coming to. Cool. Well, thank you for joining me, Ryan. Uh, hopefully I'll have you on at some other point. Yeah, anytime. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, so everybody, everybody for uh, the Chaotic Stupid podcast, uh, that's it. My name's Mike and my guest has been Ryan and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.